on this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, we are going to do some bull fighting, bull riding, cowboying, and lion hunting. We have got PBR world champion Cody Lostro in the house. Joining me for this interview is PBR bullfighter and Houndsman XP team member and my co-host for this show, Shorty Gorham. Cody has become a hardcore lion hunter and a professional guide since retiring from the PBR. Shorty is out there catching lions every day right now for a living. So you're going to hear a conversation about hard hunting, good hound work, and we're going to tie it all together in what it takes to become a world champion, to rise to the top of your game and enjoy what you love to do because you put in the hard work. If your goal in life is to have a pack of top lion hounds, if you want to rise to the top of competition coon hunting, if you want that pack of bear hounds that's going to stay in the race, we're going to talk about all of the things that it takes to get to that level. And who better to do that than a world champion? Share this podcast with your kids. If you've got that upcoming rising star, sports star, they are going to hear lessons and Cody talk about what it takes to get to the top of their game. Folks, Old South builds a heck of a dog box, but the welds are stretching with all the energy cooped up inside this box. Let's get the tailgate down. It's time to dump the box. All right, so here we are. Another episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, and I can't believe it. I've tracked down Shorty twice in less than a month to participate in a podcast. That's unbelievable. Never know when, when or where you'll find. It. Yeah, it sounds like your audio is going to suck again for this podcast. Well, let me. Uh, is it getting better now? Maybe. At okay. least I can't. At least I can't see that moppy head and that scruffy beard of yours right now. Oh man! Oh, I need a haircut. <laughs> yeah. So, Cody already asked you what happened to the beard. Would you? I want to hear that. I want to hear that explanation. I stepped stepped away. Well, I every so my my beard trimming regiment is every time we get a collar on a lion, I get to trim my beard. What are you doing out there? Your beard's pretty long now. Are you guys not hunting, or you just don't have the dog oh. power, or what? Well, the area we're in, we're 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 doing pretty well. Um, so there's there's just not many that need need new necklaces. <laughs> I hear you. Well, I'm shorty. I'm gonna let you introduce our guest. This is kind of a privilege for me to be uh, to to bring this guest on and and um you recommended him so why don't you introduce him you you know him well well yeah as you guys know you know or maybe you don't but um i guess uh fought bull for pre professional bull riders pr for oh i guess since oh six till here the last year or so and and was privileged and honored to get to uh to protect one of the best of all times 2009 pbr world champion cody lostro Welcome to the show, Cody. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, it's fun to fun to be involved in something I've listened to for a long time. We appreciate world champions listening to this crap. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wouldn't miss it. it. It's a good show. Yeah, yeah. Well, Cody, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the world championship and and how you got there and and what it was like growing up you know, the things that you had to do and what it was like to win a world championship in the PBR. And, uh, then we'll get into the lion hunt and stuff. But I, I told Shorty, I said, it's great when you see professional athletes who go on to pursue their, their hunting passions and are willing to come out and stand, you know, stand up for that. Not ashamed to talk about it. It seems like in our world, with uh, the microscope and social media and every word being measured that a lot of times our athletes are, are very cautious about what they get involved with and what they don't. And, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because you've achieved the highest level in your chosen sport of bull riding. And, uh, now you're a lion hunter in Col out in Colorado. Is that right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I'm in Colorado, uh, born born and raised here. Um, grew up in uh, Longmont, which is north of Denver there. And now, now uh, I probably don't fit in in Longmont very well anymore. It's changed. <laughs> it's changed a lot. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, just to kind of give a, an overview from the beginning, uh, you know, grew up um, – on a, on a ranch there, we raised horses and cattle and buffalo and, and farmed as well. And, you know, hunting and, and, and fishing and outdoor part of life was just always, always there growing up. You know, when I was young, actually, my dream was to, to become a trapper. I wanted to be a trapper and move to Alaska and do that for the rest of my life. And, uh, no kid. Yeah. Yeah. That was all I, all I did as a, as a kid was trapping and everything I could catch and, um, unfortunately, uh, through voter and ballot box wildlife management, um, Colorado pretty much outlawed almost all types of trapping when I was a quite, or I was fairly young at the time and it kind of put a, put a damper on all my trapping stuff. So then, you know, that, uh, just moved into hunting. We always hunted everywhere and then grew up, uh, kind of in the rodeo scene, but none of my, none of my parents or anything uh, rodeoed at all or did anything like that, but, um, had a tape actually of Cheyenne Frontier Days. Uh, it was the year that Lane Frost, most people know Lane Frost as a you know, yeah. world champion bull rider that got killed in Cheyenne is actually the year that he, uh, had got killed there and the bull riding just fascinated me. So fast forward a couple of years, my mom signed me up to ride a steer at the, at the Boulder County Fair. And, um, I had no idea what I was doing. No, no equipment, no gear, no help. <laughs> just, uh, just get on and go and, and see what happens. So fortunately some people borrowed some equipment for me and I got on and I fell off and I, I fell off for a long time, a couple of years actually, before I kind of figured out how to, how to ride anything. And how would you have been, how would you have been when your mom signed you up for that steer steer riding competition uh, i was seven at the time and i think actually i think i was supposed to holy crap <laughs> yeah i was younger uh i think at the time you're supposed to be eight and so we we lied a little bit uh about my birthday <laughs> so i could could get on with the older kids and uh it didn't matter any i wasn't gonna beat them but um yeah just uh fast forward it was something i just really loved doing and uh and I was terrible at it, really bad, like <laughs> not good at all. Uh, but it just goes to show now looking back on it, if a guy really enjoys what he does and is willing to work hard and not let discouragements and setbacks, um, you know, kill your, kill your passion for the sport that you can go as far as you want to. And um, I was fortunate enough to, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I was going to tell you something. I, I remember from the first time I ever met and talked to Shorty Gorham, he said this. He said, find something you love to do and you'll never have to work a day in your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's no joke. And they'll yeah. Uh, yeah. dang sure be some, some hard times too, but uh, it still doesn't seem like work when you love doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, Cody, so keep going, man. Tell us. Go ahead, Shorty. About- Jump in there. About, I got something I want to get to because I know we've got some bull riders uh, or maybe former bull riders or some stock contractors and whatnot that are that are houndsmen that that'll listen to this podcast and they'll get a kick out of what I'm going to get to. It'll take just a second, but about what age, Cody, did you did you get on your first bulls? Um, I got on my first like full size bull when I was 11 and uh, started competing like in the open events against the adults when I was 14. Okay. So, Mm. and then, um, you one time told me where you practiced when you were, when you were just real young and and first starting out and, and I was mind blown. Do you, do you remember, uh, where you told me you practiced? Uh, at, uh, well, mainly one of two places, either at, uh, Kevin Rich's bull riding here in, in uh, right around Greeley or Windsor all the time. And then um, um, Doug Joseph's place as well. And he was, he was taking bulls to the, Oh, well, you know what? Okay, and then also in college, it was Hal Burns. Um, there you that, go. That's there what you go. Of, that's yeah. what I was, 
right there. And and uh, for the listeners that that uh, rodeoed or, or or anything that know the name Hal Burns, they're chuckling right now because I'm going to tell you, Chris, Hal Burns bulls were the biggest, meanest, scariest man killing <laughs> bastards that you ever wanted wanted to get in the arena with and when he told me that he's like oh yeah we in college we practiced on hal burns bulls and i was like oh my god <laughs> are you alive <laughs> oh man yeah, how, yeah how's how's bulls they they struck fear in a lot of guys they were big mean fighting son of a guns but at the time back then <laughs> hell i didn't know any different that's just bulls you know i, I figured they're all like that Ignorance is bliss, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're going to get into boxing, why not climb in the ring with Mike Tyson right off the bat, you know, and, and just go for it. <laughs> and that's what you were doing every time. When I went to a rodeo and Hal Burns was a stock contractor, you knew one thing. You were going to work your ass off that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shorty, what did that mean? I mean, how you were you were working your ass off in a whole different way. Yeah, well, like, like you know, you go to a lot of rodeos or bull ridings, and and there's, you know, there's a few out every night that you'll that you know, you know, dang sure got an attitude, and they and they know how to find a guy and and whatnot, and you know you're gonna have to work on those few. You know, if there's 15 guys out, you know there's, you know there's three guys that you're, it's damn sure gonna be game on. You better have, you know, be sharp, and. uh and what I mean by well, those I've, bulls I've got know a, how to, go ahead. What I mean by those bulls know how to find a guy. Just, like those bulls that are mean, they yeah. uh, they learn to feel where that guy comes off and immediately switch directions and go that way and go find mm. that bull. And all of Hal's bull, bulls were that way. Oh, so so like when you're, it, we'll get to the PBR stuff. When we get to the PBR stuff, I got a question about about bulls. So go ahead, go ahead, Cody. Okay. Take um, it away. Yeah. Yeah. So is yeah, basically just as, a, you know, coming up through youth rodeo, doing all that stuff, getting on, you know, the Hal Burns bulls and learning how to, how to ride and how to get hooked and how to get away and all the things, um, turned into, you know, a PBR career It's something that I always thought that I wanted to do. And when I got the opportunity, um, you know, it was hard. It was a step up and, um, and damn sure. Well, how'd you get there? Because you didn't, it's not just like you walk down to the office and say, Hey, I'm going to be in the PBR. I rode bulls at Hal Burton's. <laughs> can I, can I get in, get in, uh, the unleash the beast tour on Saturday night? Yeah. So you go through a process, of, um, basically of proving yourself, you, you buy a membership and you're on what's called a permit. And so you have to compete in some lower level events on your permit, um, which are typically, you know, they don't pay as good, a little bit lower level competition. And when you win enough, then you, you graduate to a full blown member on your card. And once you're on your card, you can get into a little bit bigger events that pay a little better, tougher competition. And when you start doing well enough, basically you earn your way to the, the top level. Um, right now it's called the unleash the beast tour. Um, and, and when you get that opportunity, it's not a given. You have to keep competing and keep doing well to maintain your spot. And if you start to slack off, uh, you know, you can lose your position there. So it's it keeps it real competitive, sure. right? Um, and uh, and there's ups and downs. You know, it's sometimes a guy goes through some rough spells and sometimes he goes through some really good spells. And the idea is to minimize all those ups and downs and have a consistent um, – you know, career of, of winning. And so fortunately I was able to do that for a long time. I went to, uh, from 2005 was my, my rookie year and was fortunate enough to win rookie of the year that year and, um, won the world championship in 09 and then went to every finals from then until 2014 was my last finals and had, uh, Oh, I had some physical stuff that, uh, basically ended my career, but, um, you know, I was thankful to be able to, uh, to be able to do it as long as I did. And man, the, the, you get, you get around that level of competition with, the, I call them the wolves, you know, that's the, the best of the best. <laughs> um, you get to play with the wolves for a while. Uh, it'll change your outlook on, on a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, every person that's out there on that card that night has, has got a shot at winning 
You know, they're the top of their game. I can't – I mean, that is the best of the best right there. Yeah, being around the best is, you know, helps helps elevate your game as a bull rider. And also, like, from, from Shorty's point of view on the dirt as a bullfighter, um, you know, when you're around that many – world-class athletes whether they're riding bulls or fighting bulls um they can't help but make you a better person and a better athlete and that uh you know the camaraderie between the riders and the bullfighters and, and everybody involved there it's it's like nothing else i could maybe compare it to you know other other high danger type professions where you get pretty damn close to the people you're around all the time and uh that's something that you can't recreate super super thankful to, to have been able to make a living there for as long as i did that's you said something cody there that that um we you and i both saw time and time again you get you get a new guy comes in and and makes it on the unleashed beast tour and, and uh it doesn't take long they either they either rise to the level of of everybody that's there or they go home and there's 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 really not much in between. It's, it's either, it's either they are or they aren't. And I don't know what it is, but I, well, I do. The cream always rises to the top. And, and, uh, did, did, do you feel like you saw the same thing when those guys came in? They either, they either rose or went home. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, there was a lot of guys with a whole bunch of talent that come in, you know, and, and, Mm -hmm. We expected a lot of them, and then it just never materialized. Um, but you could see some guys even that come in and didn't have quite the talent of some of these others. If they were willing to work at it and work their asses off, they would make it. They would they would do the deal. But but yeah, it was it was all or nothing. I, I've and I've we, seen that in everything from recru training recruits to Marines to to everything. You know, the Dave Grossman said one time he's a famous author. Uh, lieutenant colonel in the army wrote a book called on killing and he said teaching somebody to shoot is 90 percent physical and 10 percent mental being in a gunfight is 90 percent mental and 10 percent physical there you go and, and um that is the difference between a champion and somebody that just enjoys i think i want to be a bull rider i've seen it so many times you get this guy that walks into recruit training and and he looks like he's a crossfit champion and you're thinking, okay, what's this guy really made of? And then this little pudgy kid over on the side that's got the desire and the discipline to work and and the mental the mental fortitude to carry on and do what he needs to do is gonna outperform that that guy's gonna the, the CrossFit champion is gonna go home crying. The guy that's mentally tough and mentally prepared for the situation, he can he can figure out how to accomplish the other things. Is that what you've seen? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I'd say uh, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's between your ears. It's between their ears more than anything. Um, and how much does that, that so much of that transfers to other, other parts of life, right? You know, you've heard the saying, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Uh, so, so those guys that are willing to work regardless of the, the line of work, I think are the, the, the guys that create or that make exceptional, uh, athletes warriors businessmen houndsmen whatever it is them are the people that that rise to the top absolutely what do you got Christian, something to add there yeah well you were talking about you know in a gunfight it's 90 percent physical or or mental 10 percent physical and it's the same like to me your first your first years of bull riding or bull fighting you're learning the physical parts of it you're, you're, you know, the technique and, and the balance and the, the move here, move there, all that stuff. Um, once you get that pretty well figured out, then the rest of it's a mental game. And, and, and in bull riding, um, every, every jump can kill you, you know, the, the next jump can kill you. And it's, it's convincing your mind that, Hey, I'm okay. I'm staying in the fight. And, um, and it's, it's a danger factor as as uh the same as a gunfight is and so yeah the 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 people with a strong mind and the will to win at all cost um those are the guys that rise to the top so yeah i would i would totally agree with it, everything you say it, it is it's 90 percent 
mental when you when you're on that bull's back and 10 percent physical it's just crazy i mean i'm like i'm like the ultimate fanboy here talking to you cody because i got like <laughs> a million questions <clears throat> about what you what you've done there and and uh i've been in a few gunfights and i wouldn't climb on a bull so um it's well it's what you grow up with and and what you get used to and and what you're trained for and um that's that's kind of what i'm wanting to tap into and you you kind of led to what i'm going to roll into here in a few minutes we're not talking about this part yet but uh you know how we prepare mentally for a houndsman but my question for you is what kind of training did you do in the off season uh to to make sure that you stayed sharp and and different things when you were on that that march to the world championship did did you prepare yourself prior to the the kickoff of that season yeah yeah actually so in in the bull riding world right we we only make money if we're winning so i can't spend a whole lot of time sitting home because i'm not making any money um so i would be going as much as i could and, and moreover i uh, felt like i comp i competed better i performed better when i was getting on a lot of bulls so i was going quite a bit but um physically you know there's always injuries to deal with so you're trying to prepare your yourself to withstand those injuries the best you can and also you know be as strong and agile and and quick as possible you won't overpower a bull but you can be faster than him so that's kind of what what my focus mm -hmm. was always on the balance and agility and, and quick reactions so i'd stay in the gym uh ride a lot of horses you know i raised cattle as well so we were always doing something with cattle on horseback or whatever um did but, you ever ride one of those buffalo you know i've never been on a buffalo uh i think when Have my, you ever seen that video guy on a buffalo oh yeah that's great mm -hmm. <laughs> shorty yeah i've rode something? a buffalo Oh yeah, no, I've been on one. Yeah, well, I used to work <laughs> on Prosser, so anything crazy or stupid or whatever, yeah, you got to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shorty, you and I were talking a couple of days ago about uh, a concept that you were you were alluding to about being in shape and being in game shape, and we were talking about how that applies to professional athletes, and then we can also carry it over to hounds. So I'm gonna let you take this part and uh talk about that yeah no i yeah i'm glad you said that because i was fixing to ask cody that exact question and and you can go as a professional athlete um you can be in the gym all you want to be but there's there's being in shape and then there's being in game shape and i remember you know in the off season back in the day uh i would be hunting guiding lion hunts and whatnot and so you're in the mountains you're hiking you're up and down you're you know high elevation so your oxygen level is good well then you go to new york in the first part of january and we have a three-day event and after that event just you're so sore and it's because you're in shape but you're not in game shape so cody that like um going to as many events you said you stayed pretty busy going to events that that had to help just staying in that game shape and can you describe the difference of of being in shape and, and what getting on all those bulls and being in game shape. Absolutely. Um, it's a, exactly like you described it, uh, between the two. Anytime we had, I had some time off and I was able to, you know, work out hard, be ready to go. Felt like I was ready to kick some ass. And then I show up to the event and regardless of how the riding went, I was always sore always. And, and it's exactly for that reason. There's just, some things you can't duplicate in the gym or anywhere else, especially when it comes to bull riding that, uh, the only, <laughs> the only place to get it is on the back of a bull. So if you can, if you stay in that game shape, uh, man, it definitely reduces some of the injuries and also just that general soreness that, that a guy gets. How does that apply to the hound side of it, Shorty, that you were talking about? I think we were making a correlation there. Yeah, no, and I, well, and that's, I'd like, cause I'm sure Cody's seen the same thing, but you can, you know, you can road your dogs, you can, you can do whatever you want to do to keep those dogs in shape, but until, you know, and I know you've seen it, Chris, I know you keep your dogs in shape and, and when you go to your first bear hunt of the season, when, after, after 
even after the first day, you see those dogs are just wiped out and that, and, th and they will continue second day, third day, but a few days in, they're just, it just, it hurts them, you know, and, and they're tired and wiped out. But if you push through it and you keep going, eventually they get in, that's what we call game shape. And that's, and, and I guess you could call it, um, uh, game shape as well for hounds because it's, they're chasing games. Yeah. So it's the same yeah. thing. And I'm sure Cody, you've probably seen the same thing in your hounds, huh? Yeah, for sure. Especially like, so here in Colorado, we don't have a pursuit season or anything. So we get to hunt, uh, well, we can't run bear either. So we get to run lion, uh, end of November through April. It's, and then I actually go up to Wyoming early and hunt starting in September because our season opens earlier than ours, but still you're looking at four months there when, um, I don't have anything to run here in Colorado. So I exercise those dogs every day, checking cows and checking fence and everything. They always come with me and I feel like they're in good shape, but yeah, you, you put them in the mountains on some elevation and some adrenaline behind them. And it's, uh, <laughs> it takes a little bit to get them going again. Man, I'm telling well, you, those hounds, those hounds can get spun out the first few days. And I think that's the difference between, you know, the I can run them on treadmills, I can swim them, I can road them, I can do all this other stuff. But the emotional part of it, the mm -hmm. the way your emotions can take you away, um, and I, I, it can happen to hounds too, whether you're – you know, you haven't been on a bull for three months or this is the first time that you're going to run a bear this season. I see the same things in my hounds. They get spun out and crazy. You got to yep. get a couple races under them and get some. I mean, I rode the dogs. I'll rode the dogs before I go out and hunt just to, to take the edge off of them. Well, and, and, it, and if you watch your dogs, you'll see, um, you know, they're, you, you, you're getting ready to go hunt. You, you let the dogs out. Uh, they go run around, they go jump in the truck. They're all excited, but when they're when they're hunted and they're dialed in, yeah, buddy, they walk out of their kennel. They go over there, they take a leak, they they take a dump, they walk over, they jump in the truck. It's a it's a different, you know, just a different aura with the dogs. It's it's they're it's all that's when they're it's their a best. whole lot different when you're 25 days in versus the first day in. Absolutely, uh, they just. Yeah, I mean it's crazy how how they can adjust, and I'm sure that's how. I, this is why I wanted to have you on, Cody, because I, I'm sure you felt the same way. Because how does that lead up to the World Championship? Uh, at the beginning of the PBR season, you start accumulating points. Talk briefly about how that works and and how you feel at the beginning of the season versus going into the end of the season. Yeah. Yeah. So the way the point system is set up and it's been tweaked over the years, but basically the, the bottom line is you accumulate points for winning. And so you want to be consistently winning, accumulating the most points. And, um, you know, we talked about the dogs being dialed in after they've, they've got that edge off them and, and they're in the zone and they're hunting and they know what their purpose is and they're not wasting excess energy on pointless things, uh, directly correlates to uh to riding bulls or uh, world championship season um when you get in that zone it's like it's like you're in your your own little world you know and all the distractions and everything don't don't matter it's single-minded single-mindedly pursuing the goal um and honestly the hunting hunting is what what prepared me to win that world title and i can actually bring this back to shorty uh me no kidding yeah that's me, cool so me and in, in 08 i had a chance to win win the world title like i'm in the finals second or third or something I had a real shot to win it and i was worried about things that didn't matter you know i, I hadn't I, I let that uh those distractions kind of keep me off my game i did okay but not as good as i needed to do um me and shorty went on an elk hunt at, after the finals that year um down in new mexico and uh and i remember actually we were cruising up and he, one... and he short sheeted me <laughs> yeah he what shorty he short sheeted me <laughs> <laughs> he bumped you he knocked you down so he could take the shot no 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 he, we we went one of the first nights we were there i'm up with the with the outfitter uh drinking whiskey or whatever and and 
Cody's like, yeah, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> like, okay. So he goes to bed. Well, I come in there about an hour later, get in bed. Well, he took the sheets from the bottom and folded them up to the top. So when I got in, there was only half. He literally short sheeted you. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and and I just hear this. I just hear this oh, sticker yeah. in, over there in the other bed. I you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyways, keep I've going. been waiting for that opportunity yeah. for years, and I finally got it. So I wasn't gonna let it pass up. <laughs> 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 um, go ahead Cody. but uh but yeah between uh, the hunting and the short sheeting pl- pl- playing pranks on shorty um i remember we were doing we were hiking somewhere steep mountain deep snow and i'm just hoofing it through there and uh hamburger and it was yeah hamburger hill that was the name of it that's what they, um, they call it. yeah yeah and it and it just hit me i was like <clears throat> it simplified my world, I guess, you know, at that time it was just about one goal. It was just getting up that hill and it hurt and it sucked, but I was going to get to the top no matter what. Um, and, and I guess for, in my bull riding career, that just simplified things for me. Cause I'm like, I just got to change my perspective here. I, I, all these distractions don't matter. I have one goal and I'm going to break it down from the goal, the main goal, right? Winning a world title. I'm going to break it down into little attainable goals that are right in front of my face. I can reach out and grab. I can take one more step up this damn mountain. I can take, you know, ride one more jump, ride one more bull, one more event. And it really cut out all the junk where it was so easy to focus on the goal right in front of me. I knew if I kept grabbing that goal, I'd get to the top. And I took that same mindset into the next year. And then it was a game changer. You know, it uh, had always been a contender, but now, now I could actually do it because I I focused mm-hmm. on the goal and got rid of the distractions. Um, it sounds e- it's a lot easier to say it than it is to practice it. Um, keeping those distractions out of your head, or whether you're a bull rider or a hound, can be challenging. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that's the mindset. That is the mindset. It's it's not about focusing on the end goal. It's about that little step right in front of me is is what got me to the where I wanted that, to be. The- Man, there's so many correlations there between being a houndsman and the things you're talking about there. But it seems like when you're in it, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to take that step back and take that 30,000-foot view. And it sounds like that that hunting trip is what did it for you. But have you have you tried to apply that to your hound hunting and with your hound? How long have you had hounds, Cody? Um, I've had my own since... 18 so four 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 years yeah um yeah but i've been hunting them with uh with with friends and stuff since 08 um but i i was riding bulls at the time and i didn't want to have dogs sitting around that weren't getting used so i i never had my own um when i quit riding for good then then i went ahead and got my own in fact i think if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and it might have been that day, it might have been the next day after that Hamburger Hill incident. And if you were hurting, gosh dang, I'm glad you said that because I was dying and I. <laughs> but you wouldn't quit, would you? It's like yeah, I ain't quitting. No, but, I, but but anyways, I'm glad I I. Well, I didn't notice it if you were hurting. I just put it that way. But but I think the next day we were coming down and there was there was some snow. It was not a fresh snow, but there was some snow and we found a lion track. Um, and then I remember you, uh, you going with the, and I don't remember his name, the outfitter's son and went and looked at his hounds and, uh, and you'd mentioned then, I think that you, that you wanted to someday get some hounds. Yep. Does that yep, sound right to you? Yep. That trip. And then, that and then trip you booked a hunt. started at all. No kidding. Yeah. And, and you booked yep. a lion hunt with them and came back that winter or something. I did. Yeah. A couple yeah. weeks after our elk hunt, I come back down there and, and hunted lion with him. And, uh, and we didn't end up catching anything then, but, uh, yeah, that got me hooked. Yeah. So, so 2008, you started getting a real good, in, big interest in hounds and then, and then what year did you say you got your own 18? 18, so yeah, 10 years that's later. when it all kind of, yeah, that's kind of when it all set in around you. It's like, nobody else is going to train him for me. Nobody else is going to hunt him for me. 
This these all these hounds are here, and they're all dependent on me. How what that feel like? Oh, felt great to be honest with you, Chris. Uh, the at the time, you know, I keep I keep referring back to bull riding, but I'd retired from riding bulls and not necessarily on the way I wanted to or when I wanted to. And I wasn't, I wasn't in a great spot mentally. Um, something I'd love doing and I'd done my whole life all of a sudden was over. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, fast forward to getting these dogs and shorty, shorty helped me out there on getting, getting something good to start with. And, uh, and it gave me kind of a renewed sense of purpose on something that, all right, I can really work hard at this. And I know, I know I can keep learning and keep improving and keep reaching that next goal. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it, it really changed my, changed my world. Yeah. It's, um, uh, we, we take a lot of veterans and things hunting with freedom hunters mm-hmm. and, um, uh, we found the same thing happening with that group of guys. You know, they come back from the military. That's all they've known. They have a hard time relating with other people and boom, all of a sudden they find a purpose and, um, or they find some place to, uh, to, uh, find that solace, you know, and it's all good stuff, man. Good stuff. So, so what are you doing these? The, the, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because I shared one of your social media posts not too long ago. And uh, it was about the narrative of hunting. And do you remember writing that? Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, about the, that pregnant or that nursing female lion I'd caught. You right? bet. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, that's become more, I think it's more important now than ever that, as hunters and especially as houndsmen, we try to educate people on, on what we do and why we do it and how, how we do it. Right. Cause there's so much misinformation out there mm-hmm. on, uh, from the antis and, and the antis, you're probably never going to change their minds. Right. That's not, it's not probably ever going to happen, but the people that, that don't know that aren't one way or the other, that we've, we've got to do our part on, on teaching them about what we do and how we do it. Because if we don't, if we don't, they're going to believe the first thing that gets, gets thrown their way from these antis and it's completely wrong. And uh, hunters in general, and especially houndsmen is a really small portion of hunters. Um, you know, that we're, we're at the first end of the the chopping block here. And, And we've seen it time and time again, especially in recent years, that these these animal rights yeah. groups keep coming after the the hound hunting is because that's the easiest bait for them or that's the easiest target for them right now. Um, so anyway, yeah, Colorado I'm not. Colorado barely escaped. Colorado barely escaped having uh, having hound hunting outlawed this year. And um, you know, so so the thing that the thing that I really liked about that, Cody, is I know you've got being a world champion you've got a you've got a fan base and not everybody that follows you is a houndsman and a hunter and um you know for you to come out and make that statement with your history and with your background that was huge and that that spoke volumes to me about the type of person you are and the fact that and and the deep love and passion you have for the hunting absolutely it's I think it's if I'm not if I'm not doing my part, then I'm I'm hurting this I'm hurting the lifestyle, you know. Um, and I feel it's that way for all of us. And regardless of what I've accomplished in the arena or life or whatever, um, I'm still gonna I'm still gonna shoot you straight on on what's you know what I believe and everything. And so um, I appreciate that. I appreciate your your uh, recognition of that. I guess, um, but I also also throw it out there that like regardless of what i've done in the sports world it's not going to change the way i interact with you know everybody else so i'm not, i'm not too worried about uh about uh i shouldn't say burning bridges that's, that's what it you, you know what i mean i'm not afraid of offending anybody like this is the truth and i'm playing it out there hey have you guys heard of dogs are treed 
That's that company that we keep plugging on this podcast because Dogs Are Treat supports your lifestyle. And they do that by contributing to all kinds of hound associations across the United States. But the way they really do it is they produce products that are useful for you and your hounds. When you look at their products like Dogs Are Hydrated, you're going to keep those dogs hydrated in this hot, hot weather. And then paws are protected. You got to keep a hound on his feet if you want him to keep hunting. And then their tie outs, their premium tie outs are out of this world. We just been talking about them on social media and stuff. You know, literally, uh, Lauren says she can get dogs out of the truck and tied out in under five minutes. We're going to have to see a video on that. But check out Dogs Are Treed at dogsartreed.com. Enter that promo code HXP20% off. You're going to get 20% off your order on the best gear in the industry by the best company in the industry that's producing high-quality gear for you. Check out Dogs Are Treed. Also, check out Freedom Hunters. Fall is coming, folks. If you haven't made plans with me yet to coordinate a Freedom Hunters event, take America's Heroes, our returning veterans who have come off active duty, recently home from deployment, or somebody that's a veteran or a Gold Star family member that wants to get into hunting, Freedom Hunters is the thing to pursue. I've been on several of these events. They're high class or high quality. You heard Seth talk about going to uh, Canada, British Columbia with Freedom Hunters. He had a blast. We did a whole episode about it. You're missing the boat. If you're not paying it back, check out Freedom Hunters at freedomhunters.org. Yeah, that's the message it sent to me. It's like, here's a guy that's won a world championship, been at the top of his game, and he is not going to change his uh, principles, his, his core values in order to stay at the top of his game. He's not going to sell out for the next endorsement or the, you know, whatever it is. And uh, when I saw that, I thought, man, this is a guy that, that I could, I could enjoy time with, but also, you know, I want to have you on the podcast and be able to talk about that. That was just, that's what it said to me, Cody. And I appreciate you saying it. Because most of us are looking for those people. You know, we've known sports figures for years that we, you know, we'd read an Outdoor Life article and it would, you know, it, it might mention that they were a hunter or something like that. But on the public stage, they would never say anything. They would never talk about it. They, you know, because they would, they were afraid, they were listening to their publicists and they were, you know, doing all this other stuff. And when I saw you do that, I thought, this is the guy right here. I like, I like this guy. See, and I, I, well, think, I, appreciate oh, that. I think Cody, you tell me, but I, I think that's doing that is something that, that we've learned through, through the PBR and through rodeo is, is being proactive because being a sport that dealt with animals and, and is on TV, we constantly had people coming at us. It, it was always, you know, and, and in the bull riding world, we have the st- statistics that the animals win 70% of the time. And, and, you know, it's a, it's a 1700 pound animal against a 135 pound guy and, and da, 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 da. But we always had to be proactive. And, and so we were always out there giving tours, um, behind the scenes. And I know Cody's done a bunch of those and, and, and being proactive. And I think that's something that, that you have done better than I, Cody, um, is carrying that over into the hounds world. And I, and I read some of those posts and I was like, holy cow, like, this is, this is great. Like accolades to you, man. Good job. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Uh, maybe, maybe all those years of media training finally paid off, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh man, that's great. <laughs> yeah. We're not trying to make you the poster child for the, the pro hunting movement here or anything, Cody. I just, I just wanted to recognize that Absolutely. part of it and uh yeah. and and even talk about the fact that i wish i could find more professional athletes that were at the top of their game you know bo jackson is a guy that i think about you know top of his game you know and and he hunts and he's not afraid to talk about hunting but then i can name several other professional athletes that i know are avid hunters that that We'll never talk about it. I've I've tried to get them on the podcast. I've I've talked to them about it, 
and and you can't find those guys that that are that are willing. So at that point, I'm want, I'm wondering, okay, so do you really do you just like to hunt in your spare time? But you really, and I get it. I mean, everybody's got to make a make a living and stuff. But uh, that's that's why that's one of the things that stood out to me with you, Cody, was your willingness to just put it out there like it is. And uh, it was well thought out. It was well articulated, and it made mm-hmm. a lot of sense. Yep. Well, that's good to hear because yeah. some of the stuff I say don't always make sense. But <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. But, yeah but, we, you uh, know, we get, we get we get messages every day. <laughs> it's fun to how many, um, how many people in the rodeo world, uh, rodeo and or bull riding world, actually turn out. Um, just like you, Cody, to be post career outfitters and or guides. Um, yeah, cause you and I, I know we have several mutual friends that are, that are outfitters and guides and or guides, um, after their career. Yep. Yep. And several, several bull riders actually that I rode with, um, yeah. as well. It's, uh, yeah. I don't know. You remember Wes Silcox, he went to the to oh, the yeah. NFR riding bull yep. several times. He's he's guiding up in Wyoming now, and so is uh, uh, oh crap, Hammaker. Wow. Uh, good friends, huh? Yeah, yeah, great friends. You can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't get to come in here and us not bust your chops. I don't care if you've won a world championship or not. No, I have right at it, man. That uh, <laughs> that makes me feel right at home. <laughs> um, but but shorty's right yeah there's a lot of us uh have, have fallen into the same line of work and, and i don't know i don't know what it is about the about our our mindsets but it's a it's a good fit so are you are you doing professional outfitting now that's correct yeah um i've been guiding for an outfitter here in colorado comanche wilderness outfitters for a few years um didn't really plan on it i just was catching lions and having fun and um and uh kind of caught the caught the eye of this outfitter up here and he asked if i'd be willing to work with him and and here we are a few years later and it's it's pretty nice like um you know we only take six seven maybe eight guys a winter so it's not super busy still gives me plenty of time to to screw around and do my own thing and um but at the same time it's uh it's been it's been a blast too to be able to have that opportunity yeah yeah so before we get to further on chris i want to so um i think well i guess it was 18 or whatever um i had uh i had and and i'm speaking for cody because cody won't speak for himself um but i think it was 18 whatever i had i had put two dogs i think two dogs on facebook that i was gonna let two made dogs go and and Cody texts me. He's like, "Hey, I want those dogs." So I said, hey, "Ah," I said, "Hang on, let me let me put a little package together for you. I've got a couple of young dogs. Let me get a little better handle on them, and then um, and I'll put a little package together for you, so that it's kind of a starter package." And these two these two older dogs were they they were bomb proof, you know. And uh, anyways, um, he he bought those dogs. I met him over in New Mexico. Um, he, he bought the dogs and he went home and we, we did the deal in the summertime so that they could transition from South Texas to the, the cold winter, um, and be ready for it. And Cody immediately, and, and, and I, I will say this, the, the thing about a professional athlete is they're disciplined and they're coachable. You, you will not meet a world champion that's not coachable of any sport. And so Cody was really supple in that way where he, he let me kind of tell him, Hey, at first I was like, Hey, listen, these, these two older dogs, if you go, if, if you go in there and the, and the pups are barking and the older dogs come back, shock the pups. They're, they're doing wrong. Just trust those old dogs do this, but don't hunt with anyone else. Just hunt with you and those dogs and get to know them. And they're going to teach you what you need to know. And, and Cody did that. And next thing you know, he's catching lion after lion after lion. And I said, I said, Hey, Cody, I said, have you been keeping track? He said, no. I said, do, do me a favor. Start keeping track of every lion and bobcat you catch. 
Like, write it down. It 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 doesn't mean anything now, but it'll mean something in the, in your future. And and the other thing is, they're disciplined, they're coachable, and they work their ass off. And and so yeah. I I'll never forget. He was sending me pictures all the time and and whatnot. And it was the last day of the season there, and he sent me a picture, and I think it was <laughs> it was a selfie, and it and it was either the text. B- below the selfie was either last day of the season number 25 or number 26 and uh and i was like man that's awesome whatever you know da 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 and uh about an hour or two hours later i get another selfie it says scratch that found a track on the way out caught 26 or 27 <laughs> that was Ocho's first season of lion hunting so that that's why he's it didn't take him long to get into the outfit and, or the, the guiding business because he put in that kind of work and was able to put up those kind of numbers. And that is not done other than putting in work. So, yeah. 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 And absolutely. I mean, yeah. Part of that too is, is the help from you, right? The, uh, the willingness to, to help me out and coach me. Like you said, the, um, I feel like a lot of the, the hound world doesn't want to do that so much you kind of got to granted we knew each other for a long time so it's that's a no-brainer but (laughs) but being able to help somebody new is and then the fact that you did it was huge for me and i thank you for it um because because yeah i'm willing to work hard and and do everything i have to do but at the end of the day you got to have some guidance too and i'm thankful that uh That that you showed that to me That's one thing we talk a lot about on this podcast, challenging the older guys to mentor younger guys and challenging younger guys to be smart enough to listen to the older guys and, or just more experience. Because if we're going to talk about lion hunting, I've been hunting hounds for 40 years and Cody, you could teach me stuff about lion hunting. I'm a wannabe. Um, I might know some stuff about hounds, but but as far as coming to your neighborhood, it's not and catching lions. That's not going to happen. So, um, you know, my old saying is, and it's really it's really uh, something that I've learned for myself is uh, the only thing you got to be to do to be in this game for forty years is keep waking up, and you can be in it. Doesn't mean you're at the top of your game, and um, but we challenge people to be mentors and allow themselves to be coached and, and, and be menteed by other more experienced people. So there, in that, that, you, man. Hey, that, that last thing you said right there, be mentees. And, and that's the thing is like, <clears throat> if I knew Cody wouldn't listen or work his ass off at it, I wouldn't have helped him. Yeah. But I, but I knew, I knew Cody, I knew, his dedication. I knew how, how hard he was going to work at it. And I knew all, and I don't want any credit for it. it all the credit goes to Cody. It, he did it all on his own. All, all I did was put some words in his head every once in a while. And, yeah. and that's the thing though, for the, for the young kids, like this is where you need to listen. Like you need to be willing to work and willing to listen. And, and the old guys and, and uh, they'll help you. But, if you're not willing to listen and you're not willing to work, they're they're not going to waste their time. And that's that's the thing is it's it's a two two way street. Like, yeah, we need to we need to be better mentors, but we also need to know that our time is not being wasted. Exactly, I agree with so, that. But I'll I'll also talk from the old guy camp here and say just because you've had a few bad experiences with some some younger guys or some new people in this sport. Don't give up. No. We can't afford to give up. We have to be looking for that next generation and those people that can help us. And and even when I'm hunting with somebody that's younger or maybe not been in it for as long as I have, I'm watching how they do stuff, not so I can correct them, but more than likely I can learn something there. And um, we're all in this journey together, and if, if we ever feel like, Man, I've I'm I've arrived. I've accomplished everything. Sell your hounds, get out of it, go do something else, find a new challenge in life. You know, because uh, you're you should be 
you should be looking to expand your journey and, and your knowledge until the day you can't take another step or, or draw another breath. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and, and the thing is though, like you can, um, and, and I, like I admire people that just like to hound hunt just to hear the dogs bark as much as I admire the best hunters in the world. Like, I don't care like, whatever floats your boat, get after it. It's your but, journey, man. That's right. And, but the guys, the guys that are winning the competition hunts that are, they're putting up, you know, a pile of lions or bears or whatever. Those guys look at you, look at young kids or, or, or people wanting to get started just like they look at their dogs and they're looking for something and when they see it, they're willing to spend their time and and make it better. And and that's the thing is, is like, and I'm I'm talking to young, you know, newcomers, whatever. Be willing, like be be that young dog that that guy's looking for. Be you know what I mean? Because yeah. those guys they will, they'll spend for the sure. time and they'll help you, and you'll learn so much. Like I did it the hardest way you could do it, you know, because I did, I had to, but I like when you have somebody that can, that been there, done that, that can mentor you. Oh my God. It saves decades, you know? Yeah. You, but. you're the beneficiary of all that time and experience and all the trials and tribulations that they've been through. And I can remember thinking back in the day, it's like, why are we doing things like this? This is dumb, you know? <laughs> and then, and then looking back at it, it's like, okay, this is why we did that. And, um, so I've been on both ends of that and sometimes I found a better way, but a lot of times it was a deal where sure. shut up and, uh, ask a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. And it translates into now, like I've been fortunate enough to have been start co the PBR launched a new team league where now that we've got teams and coaches and franchises and it's this big deal. And that's what you just mentioned, Shorty, exactly what. I'm looking for in some of these young bull riders is I, if you can listen and work hard and put everything you got into it, I know that guy yep. can be successful and that's who I want to work with and translates right. to riding bulls, to running dogs, to anything like as, as young people or as people in general feel like if we'll listen and put in the work, there's no, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. I don't yeah. even know where we're going to go after that. Well, I, well, <laughs> well I'm. You just, I know you just closed out the whole podcast, Cody. <laughs> we're going to go back. To the dogs go, Shorty. I, I love that, and and we're going to go back to the dogs because I know, Cody, that you've you've you know, I you got those four dogs for me. I know you've added dogs and subtracted dogs and and got more dogs and stuff. So, um. He probably Dude, called everything he got from you after he got some good ones. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Well, that's why. Yeah, he had to. He had to do some <laughs> subtracting. That the subtracting was the four I, I got him to start. <laughs> but um, uh, do, is do you look at your dogs the same way as you look for for these young bull riders that are going on your team? Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, those the dogs that want to work and are willing to listen. And when I say willing to listen, not saying they're not hard headed, but you know, those dogs that are smart that you can tell are thinking through things and not just being, uh, idiots. Those, those are the kind that I like. I like to work with. I like to hunt. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure you're the same way. Obviously a dog that's smart and wants to hunt is, is a much better dog to be around, but that's, that's for what sure. I'm looking for too. And those, and that's the thing, like those dogs I got from you, they are smart and they want to hunt. And that's why, you know, they turned out so stinking good. Those two males, you couldn't, you couldn't buy them from me. Yeah. And those are the two, those were the two pups that I, that I put in. The older dogs were just, just nice dogs. They weren't special. They were just nice dogs, but they were solid ass broke. And I knew they were going to help you. But what do you, other than those, and I know those older females are, getting pretty old and probably not much help or you're probably not even hunting them anymore what are you hunting nowadays and uh you know for dogs and and what are you looking for 
Yeah. Yeah. So still hunting three of those four I got from you. Um, and the fourth one is actually still hunting herself. I, I just, I gave her to some young boys that, uh, that really I'd been hunting with them and their dad and they really liked the dogs. And it was just, it was a great fit for them. Like she'll teach. Is that gypsy or I? Uh, gypsy. Yeah. And she'll teach yeah. them, you know, everything she taught me. Um, but I still got the other three and they're great, but I have added a couple of dogs, um, from Mike Kemp, um, that, uh, that are really, really coming on strong now. And then, um, another buddy of mine that has some up in North Dakota and he raises bulls as well. He had some, some nice, uh, English red ticks and he ended up giving me a couple pups and, um, both them dogs turned out pretty well, but one of them it has been real good and I'm, I'm hunting her too. Um, so yeah, a, l- a little bit of a mix from here and there, but th- at the end of the day, yeah, some some haven't made it, and and they're they're off in different homes now and just being pets. But uh, if they're want to hunt and they're smart, this it sure seems like they can they can make a living here. Yeah, and you're hunting you're hunting both just for for our listeners. I know you know I know the answer, but um. Uh, a lot of times when people think of Colorado, I know you hunt Wyoming a little bit too, but people are thinking of snow. You hunt, you hunt both dry ground and snow, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Dry ground and snow. And honestly, I, I prefer the, the dry ground myself. Uh, just everything about it is more, more challenging and, and catching them in the dirt sure seems like, uh, it's just, a it's more fulfilling for me. And, um, uh, don't get me wrong. I love good snow track and it's fun to see them dogs burn it down, but but I really enjoy the dirt and, and a lot of guys, at least in my area, don't hunt the dirt a whole lot. So if I want to get, get out and be by myself, boy, I can just go, go hunt when there's no snow and, and have the whole, the whole place to myself. When it's easier hiking without snow. You're dang right. <laughs> no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But we get a little everything here. We can go from hunting in the 80, 90 degree weather, which is, too hot but uh at least the mornings are a little cooler um or you know down to 20 below and so it takes a it takes all kinds i got i got for you go ahead chris i was just going to ask him how high elevation he was at right there where he's hunting yeah so where where i normally hunt we hunt anywhere from like 6500 feet i think the highest i've caught him is like 9400 um, yeah. typically I don't, I don't catch them up above 9,000 very often. They just not, not up there a whole lot when, when we can run them here. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Shorty. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, you were good. Um, I, I got a question because I remember vividly. Um, do you remember, and can you tell us the story of the first line you caught on your own? Oh Yeah. Yep, I remember it. I was, I was up in Wyoming, and it was after I'd got them, them dogs from you, and we'd trailed a couple in the dirt uh, before that that we didn't catch. And um, anyhow, I got up there early morning. I'm driving, and it was supposed to be the snow had supposed to have quit by then, and uh, it hadn't. It was snowing hard, hard, like them tracks were getting covered up in minutes. And I happened to cross – or one crossed the road and I, and I looked at it and it was filled with snow and I thought, well, heck that looked, that's a lion track. I think. So I let out one of those older dogs I got from you to let her check it. And, uh, sure enough, she struck and away she went. So I collared up the others and turned them loose and then up and over, you know, steep kind of cliffy, big rock type, type mountainside. We went and got up on top and, um, ended up catching that line actually pretty quick. It was maybe eight, eight, 900 yards. And, uh, and it was a female and she jumped and, and we caught her again and, you know, took a couple pictures and let her, let her sit in the tree and, and walk back to the truck. And I don't know, that was just one of the, one of the coolest feelings to, uh, to get it done on my own first time. And, uh, with, with dogs that were mine, you know, not, not, not a buddy's not something that mm-hmm. I was. Oh man, that's cool. Hunting with. Yep. That's like it, that's like making the full ride, the first time you make a full ride. Right? Yeah, yeah. First time I heard the whistle, yep. for, uh, same way. 
But yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah, exactly. when I when I learned that the whistle didn't mean uh, go pick up your bull rope. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot more fulfilling. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh. <laughs> But you know so what do you, that that never go gets ahead, old Cody. though. From that from that day on, you know it it never gets old. It, it, seeing them seeing the dogs work and and seeing them successful is is so fulfilling. And and even when they're not successful, I think just seeing the dogs bust their butts for for you is is so cool. So so now from we've heard the story about catching your first when you're you know several several lines in at this point. I don't know how many, probably a hundred lions in that you've caught with your own hounds. So how do you challenge yourself? How do you keep it interesting? How do you, you know, continue to improve yourself? What are some of those things that you're, that you're always striving for, Cody? Well, I feel like, I don't know. There's it, this, this game is very humbling. Um, and we've, you, I've heard you talk about a lot. I've discussed it a lot with other guys, but you know, different, the different scenting conditions and all the different things that we as humans can't really understand as well as the dogs. Um, so I feel like, you know, challenging, challenging ourselves, like on a, whatever, an older track, a, a worse track, you know, bad conditions, all that stuff has become, has become the new challenge, right? That's what, what I guess is, is motivating to, to get out and see what new challenge we can, we can overcome today. And it doesn't always work, but I know if we keep hammering away at it, it will. Um, and then obviously now with getting some new dogs and stuff like that is, is, you know, seeing, can I make that dog the best that he can be? Yeah. Um, cause, cause that's the name of the game, whether it's me, I want to be the best version of myself as I can every day. And, and it's the same with, with these dogs. If I can, we can make these dogs the best that they can be every day. Um, you know. Anyhow, that's that's how I look at it. Well, that's, that, what, that's what motivates me. That doesn't come without challenges, right? So, to to be the best version of yourself, or the best, or the dogs to be the best version of yourself, it doesn't it doesn't come without challenges. And failure is part of that. Like knowing your limits and then trying to break them. Yep, absolutely. If that makes sense, you know, like got to know your limits and the dog's limits and but but always trying to break them like i you know i think that's that's what makes that's what makes world champions is is not letting limits uh discourage you like limits are made to be broken yep absolutely and that's how that's how we that's how we build right like the next generation will build off our successes and next generation after that will build off their successes well i think uh, you know it's it's one of those things where we always learn more when we fail because when we fail yeah. as you know we load the hounds up and we're going down the road we start dissecting what actually happened there when yep. when when we dump dogs out on a we we hand pick a track we we dump dogs out on it and boom they tree you know tree a lion or a bear or whatever then all we think about is how good the dog looked, how good the dog looked, how good the, you know, and we get yep. self-absorbed in that. But when we fail, that's when we take time and we, we reflect on it and dissect it and find out where we can do things different. How did I fail? You know, that's where the smart person and the smart houndsman or the smart world or bull rider figures out how to be at the top of their game. You're dang right. And I was thinking about this earlier today. Um, to be, to be the best at at whatever you do, um, you have to and and you have to treat your dogs the same way. But to be the best at whatever you do, you have to be your biggest critic. You have to, you have to. I mean, you have to ride your own ass like you're that that one teacher that you had in school that really didn't like <laughs> you ride your ass yeah. like, that, like she did or he. Um, but you also have to be your biggest fan as if your mother is your biggest fan. And that's how, that's how you develop into being the best is you have, you have to ride your own ass, 
but you have to encourage yourself like your mom would. You know what I mean? And 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 I think the same is true in the hounds where you've got to be the biggest critic of that hound, but you also have to do everything you can to encourage that hound to be the best. And it doesn't always work, but uh, you, I think that's, go ahead. You can take the critic side. You can take the critic side too far too. I I've, I've known guys and sure. know guys right now that they're always looking for the perfect hound. And I've hunted with them, and, and they take this hound out, and it looks great, but it made a bobble here, and it made a bobble there. And maybe your hound got a step on it, or maybe another. And, and all of a sudden, they lose all trust in that hound. So, you know, you gotta, you get, that's a balancing act to know what's acceptable and what's not and, Would it? and figure yep. that all out in your own mind. There's, but there's things to it, like, at least in our world, like, and Cody can testify to this. There's things to it where your dogs are trailing like a son of a gun. Um, they get to a a different type of soil that might be in open sun, and and then it goes back into into cover on north facing slope, and they roll whatever. But those dogs, like, there's. You can be a critic, but you also have to understand the environment. That's right. You also have to understand the sitting conditions and the and everything about it to to be that critic because it's easy to to. Uh, well, I'll say this: a guy a guy told me this one time said dogs don't go from great dogs to shitty dogs overnight, and 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 so you you have to. I'm have to do a lot of editing on this. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, dogs don't go from good dogs to bad dogs overnight. <laughs> so, um, but anyways, and that's it. Like a lot of it is sitting conditions. Like you, they'll, they'll go across an open, you know, uh, open sandy spot that's in full sun all day, and and they've been trailing like madman, and all of a sudden they can't, and then. Um, you may have to help them or, or you get a dog that, that jumps them ahead and gets across that deal and, and, and goes on. But so those bobbles, you got to be careful on those bobbles. You better know what was, what, what's going on before you judge them on those bobbles. You bet. And that's why we produce you know. that Wednesday show called the journey. Yep. And, no, and I and, love it. I listen he, to everyone. Yeah. Houndsmen need to listen to that because, Heath is laying it out there for you. That if you listen to what he's bringing to the table, you know, he's talking about surface changes and why your dog is losing the mm-hmm. scent at this place. He's in a scent pool. His scent picture changes. He's got a surface change. He's UV breakdown, you know, all this different stuff. And that's all stuff that, that a, a houndsman that really wants to improve their game will listen to and start thinking about that. And they'll think back about how that dog was just, I mean, you turn loose in this Canyon, it's shaded, it's early morning. They run it like it's on fire. They get to the top, you know, the rim, they rim out there and all of a sudden it breaks down. Hey, watch this, Cody. That, well, that's because that lion held its scent. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You're going to get me in so much trouble now. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, tell us, tell us what you think about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. Yep. Yep. It's a. Uh, it's such a such a complicated. Those dogs are doing so much with their nose, and if we could put ourselves, if it was just a momentary thing, where all of a sudden we were transformed and with the same olfactory ability as oh, that dog, it would absolutely blow our mind. They they would come and get you and put you in a straight jacket and put you in a, in the padded <laughs> room somewhere. It's like, I don't want to live here anymore, you know, cause you'd realize how much you stink, how much your wife stinks, your girlfriend, whatever. Uh, and all of a sudden you'd just be like, this isn't a good world anymore. And I don't know how a dog does it. I, I, I read something one time it's, and this was out of a scientific study, the amount of body odor, that a dog needs to understand that a person is in a 
20 or no, I'm sorry, a 12 story building would fit in a teaspoon. If you could measure it, it would fit in, in a teaspoon. If you took that teaspoon in the building and made one drop, you know, and just dumped it out on the sixth floor, when that dog walks to the door, it knows that there's a person in that building. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine sit, standing in line at Walmart being able to smell like that? Holy smoke. I would go to Walmart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'd, be puke, you'd be puking in the M&Ms. <laughs> there, there, yeah, there's a lot. I'd go to a lot of stores before I ever went to a Walmart. Yeah. yeah, that's a, yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking here, I, should, I might be part dog because every time I go to Walmart, that's exactly what I smell. <laughs> <laughs> you've got a you've got a highly developed olfactory system. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah. No, to be able to yeah. to be able to experience that for a day, though, I do agree. It'd, it'd make you go insane. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, Cody, man, I I tell you what, we only scratch the surface with you. I I truly do appreciate you agreeing to come on the podcast. We didn't we didn't talk enough about hunting and stuff like that but uh, you got any closing thoughts for anybody any words of inspiration for these i mean you you've been looking at you know having your own pack for four years and you've achieved great success so what words of encouragement would you give some of our newcomers out there well you you put me on the spot a little bit there I've, i've never been too big uh had too many great inspirational words but if I had to tell <laughs> anybody anything about doing something you're passionate about, it's it's take responsibility, full responsibility for the outcome. It's never the dog's fault. It's never the bull's fault. It's never anybody's fault but our own. And and the reason for that is because if it's our if it's our own fault and we can take responsibility for it, we can fix the problems, and then the victory is ours. Um, so. There you go. There, there's my words of uh, wisdom for the day. That's pretty freaking inspirational, right there. That is. That, that is that. Yeah, that. Was, yeah. That was well spoken, buddy. I'm not gonna lie. You even inspired me for sure. <laughs> Sometimes you hit yeah. a home run, closing your eyes and swinging. That was. <laughs> that was. Shorty, you got any words of wisdom for the old timers that are in this thing that that might have co- come across a Cody Lowstrom like and. Uh, uh, Seize it. Seize the opportunity. You can't, yeah, you can't top what Cody just said. Oh, my whole deal is just whatever it is you're doing, go hard at it. Go like, and that's that's the thing that every world champion that I've ever met, no matter what sport it was in, they gave their all every time. And that's, that's what it takes to, and it doesn't matter what sport or what hobby you're in. Um, yeah, just give your all. Good deal, man. Well, Cody, I hope you'll come back and uh, talk with us again soon. Uh, can I get a verbal commitment on that? <laughs> you bet. <Here> we- <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it's been great. It's been great talking with you guys. And uh, anytime you want to have me again, I'm I'm all here. Man, I I I'd love to, and we'll get more into the hunting side, and uh, uh, we'll go hunt with him. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go hunting with him. Yeah, I'm yep. game. Come on, I'm game. Me, I want. I want to see what he's doing now, and and uh, we'll go hunt with him. Do another podcast at camp. Oh man, that'd be better. Your sound would be a lot better, and I wouldn't be thinking about all those beats. And you had all kinds of were you beating on the mic, or what were you doing there? Because it was cracking Coors lights in the right next to the microphone. I think. Well, it wasn't next to the microphone, but yes, that's exactly what was happening. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, I'm going to shut this one down. And uh, Cody, until we meet again, buddy, you follow your hounds and I'll follow mine. Sounds good, brother. Thank you. See you guys.